by the Center for Strategic and Contemporary Research. Um, let, me, let me just begin by saying that uh, this webinar uh, is being hosted by this institute, which, which is, which is uh, all very young people, 20 something, all of them, very, very bright. And they actually are the promise that um, the youth of the world will be uh, seriously preparing themselves and perhaps us to, um, uh, to be ready for the tomorrow's world. Uh, we have uh, very eminent panelists who, uh, in my view, do not really need introduction, but we will, I will very quickly introduce them. They are uh, eminent experts in their own fields. Um, and uh, uh, let me welcome also to the audience who has joined or those who will be joining later. Uh, this program is going live on YouTube as well, so people will uh, can can actually see this as well from there. And it's a series that this institute is doing. They've done uh, some episodes earlier on looking at different aspects. Uh, now, this altered state of the world post COVID nineteen opportunities and challenge has um, the fourth webinar. And uh, let me now at this point introduce our speakers. Um, very, very quickly so that we can uh, then ask them to um, uh, give your views. Um, we will begin uh, by, by with Mr. Nassar Mehman, who definitely for Pakistani audiences does not need any introduction. He's a very seasoned politician who's actively overseen Pakistan's national engagement with water, among other things, um, since he became a senator uh, in 2003. Uh, he has also been the chairman of the Parliamentary Committee on Water Resources, a huge experience of governance, business, academia, and resource management. He's on board of governors of the FAST University. He's also a board of governors of U.S. Pakistan Center for Advanced Studies in Water, uh, which is based in Mehran University of Engineering and Technology at Jamshur, Hyderabad. Um, a very important aspect that they're doing. Uh, and uh, Mehman Saab is currently the chairman of Water and Environment Forum of Pakistan. He will talk to us um, in a little while uh, on harnessing environmental dividends for a post COVID-19 world. And thereafter, we will have Dr. Raffaello Pentucci, uh, who's a senior visiting fellow at a very well-known Raja Ratnam Center of International Studies currently in uh, Singapore. So he has joined us from Singapore. Welcome, uh, Dr. Pucci. Um, uh, he is also a senior associate fellow at RUSI in London. He's been an associate fellow at Global Network on Extremism and Technology, um, uh, host of these things. And he also uh, is a founder of the Young China Watchers. He is on the International board, Advisory Board of Hadaya and the Advisory Board of International Counterterrorism Young Network. Uh, and uh, he also looks at China's relations with Western neighbors. Um, and uh, current today, we will be hearing more about his views on th this regard, because he's currently also working on the Chinese interests in Central Asia. He'll be talking to us on impact and future implications of COVID-19 on the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, then we'll have Dr. Fazana Bari um, uh, and you know, uh, on a personal note, I have seen her working in uh, uh, in Kajazam University a little bit when I was uh, as back as when I was a student there myself. Um, she's an avid researcher, development practitioner. She's an activist. She's an ac academician, a PhD in sociology uh, from Sussex. Um, she has worked in on gender issues, on gender governance and development. Uh, combating gender-based violence, gender mainstreaming, several areas, women, law and justice. And she's been director of Center of Excellence in Gender Studies at Kazami University. Today's subject, Dr. Bari will talk to us about is impact of COVID-19, analyzing gendered paradigms. And our final speaker then, uh, the last but not the least, would be Mr. Um, Zarar Koro, who's uh, very well known to the, those who read newspapers or watch TV a journalist who's worked extensively in both of these mediums. Um, he currently hosts a popular talk show on Dawn News called Zara Hatke. Uh, the easiest translation I can think of is uh, giving an alternative outlook to whatever he uh, chooses to look at. 
He's an avid contributor to the known newspaper, the Express Review, and many others. Today, he will talk to us on COVID-19, an accelerator for authoritarianism and fascism with a question mark. So we will be very much interested to hear that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, the, you can hear the views here and also uh, those who are interested, you can type in your questions in the chat box, uh, which will be then in the end of, uh, at, at the end and the Q&A session, we will be dealing with. Um, now let me now request uh, our first speaker, um, uh, Sar Mehman Sahib, uh, to give his views. You have the floor, sir. Uh, is the audio visible? Uh, audio, I cannot hear him. His, his I audio, think he's still got his mute on. Yeah, he's, he's on. His on. Oh, He's oh, got his mute it on. Is now mute. Okay. No, okay, is no. that all right? Yep, it's okay. Now. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Khalid Benori, and uh, good afternoon and salam alaikum to everybody who's here. I think we have a very uh, eminent uh, party speakers, and therefore I expect to learn from their views today. Uh, I think this subject is uh, very alive to us, and I must congratulate. Uh, Ailia, Ailia to and the organization uh, to have organized this. Having said this, I think I will quickly go through it. I'd like to look at it first, uh, where do we stand in terms of the environment as we speak before the, as the Corona uh, virus hit us? First of all, I think uh, if we look at it, Pakistan has got all the policies, particularly we talk of the environment policy, Pakistan has the water policy, the climate change policy, and lately the forest policy. So the policies are there. Pakistan is one of the worst sufferer in terms of the climate change. And Pakistan has participated in the international forums also, in UN, in the COP, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to go into the details, but I only say that Pakistan uh, is participating internationally as well as nationally, and I think we have a separate uh, environment ministry, which is upgraded to climate change ministry. So we are very much part of the whole global world and coronavirus is also global. So I think there is a, a synonymity and here I only say that when we talk of environment, please keep in mind that uh, environment is a very close nexus with water as well uh, as the food. So there's a, we need to remember that also. I think uh, Pakistan uh, has got all the glaciers, 7,250, if I were to be uh, approximately these glaciers, we have got, the, we have seen the, not only the glaciers we have, we have seen the climate change impact. We have the 1,000 square mile kilometers of the coastal highway, coastal uh, belt. So therefore we have all the impact that you could always have with the water, with the, Indus River Basin, as well as the Kabul River Basin, these two basins. And so the, we have been subjected to all the nat nature's vagaries already before even the corona came. So while we were at it, the corona comes. Now, what has corona brought in, in terms of the, first of all, there has been a lockdown. So from an environmental point of view, I will say, well, the lockdown, uh, the whole world has faced it and we are part of it. And it has clean. It has seen a better environment than it was before because the everybody can find the utility. The transportation system is not being used to the extent. The all the things that were emission of the um, natural gas, green gas houses emission is reduced. So all the things that are affecting the environment, pollution is reduced to some extent. However, well, when we talk of the corona, what has really polluted right now? the corona is polluted by the political environment. And I think Zarar will be able to talk about it more, so I leave it to that, that here at the moment, while the whole team is there, Dr. Zafar Mirza, and you go to NDMA, and everybody is doing, but there are so many representatives working on it that the messages sometimes gets muted or they get mixed and confused. So I think we are facing the uh, coronavirus with this pandemic is there, and uh, with some of the positives and some of the negatives. Now, having said this, Pakistan at this point in time, 
uh, what is it we can uh, we can harness the dividends? I think number one, I would say yes. The whoever says whether can we, I would say yes, yes, we can harness it because I use the word that let's reboot the system because this is the only time in the countries like Pakistan, which has been left behind in the march towards the progress towards the development, has the golden opportunity to avail of this uh, difficult situation and reboot the systems and start using the high tech and technology. And we have got technology. We need to use that. And in terms of information technology, in terms of the artificial intelligence, and therefore we need to invest right now in a big way, because this is the only way we will understand the different nexus between the water environment and the food, because we will need the food. If we talk about the food, I will say, we must all look at it that food should be plenty. Forget about the corruption that is being talked about. The fact that the food will be required so long the humans live. Therefore, I think we should use judiciously all the resources that we have. And we have got the, all the institutions are there. And one of the things that has come about is that the public health system in Pakistan is, uh, is very weak. Uh, almost non-existent in so far as the public health is concerned. Therefore, I think this is a godsend opportunity that whatever we are doing right now in terms of coordinating, there might be a weakness. Constitutional situation is there where about 18th Amendment is there, but that need to be understood and there should be more closer cooperation and understanding. So I think whatever system that we are using now, if they are used and properly documented, the systems are in play, then I think we need to keep the momentum in, in the sense that post Corona, we used to have, we need those systems so that we can uh, avail the benefit. For example, public health, we have developed the cleanliness habits. We have, we are forced into it. We are not developing, but we have to. Therefore, I think the equipment for testing, the equipment for uh, the personal gears for the uh, doctors, so on and so forth. And I think more important is that we need to be self-sufficient in terms of using the herbal medicines also, because there is no, the virus is going to be there. You listen to the medical doctors, you listen to the scientists, they say they don't know what it is. If they don't know, the only thing is that you need to develop your own immune system. And therefore, I think we need to care more allocations and the funds and the budgets need to be given for the health system. And that also means a clean drinking water. And these are the SDGs a sustainable development goal that we have signed and we have to achieve it by 2032. So I think that is one of the things, but I will say the, because it will be a long drawn thing. And I believe uh, uh, Dr. Khalid, Banori uh, Sahib, how many minutes do I have to close? Are you are sure keeping the track? Couple of minutes? Your voice is not coming. A uh, couple of minutes will be fine. Yeah. Couple of minutes, okay. Then I like to say that what we need to do is that we need databases because one of the view is that if you want to do the lockdown, then you need to do it smart lockdown. And smart lockdown means where is the data? Where is the effect of the uh, COVID? And you go there. But unfortunately, every meeting that I'm attending through the web, they're saying that they don't have the data. Even the government people are saying they don't have the data. And so, we don't know when it will hit and don't confuse the public. Give one message. If the federal government is giving one message, the provinces should go along together. We have the institutions, like we have the uh, Council of Common Interest. All the decisions could have been taken right from the beginning there and things would have gone better. But nevertheless, now whatever we have, we need to use all the system that we're using for the future. And I would say the laws are there. Some of the laws are coming in. But the more important thing, how we uh, utilize, how do how we implement those laws. So let's do this. And I would say today is a very fine day that we are discussing this. Today is the 50th Earth Day that is being observed in the world. And uh, this on this very day, and the Mother Earth is telling us that be kind to me, my children. You have not been. We have not used the resources of the Earth well. And I think whatever we are going to do this and technology will mean e-governance. Our systems are changing. We, For example, right now, we are, instead of traveling all the miles from, uh, let's say, uh, UK or from Singapore, we are on the net. We have saved a lot of time. We have saved energies. We have sa saved a lot of things. So these things should be adopted. 
and same thing is for the education also. I would say that uh, databases are very important. Our value system can change. And for Muslims in Ramadan, it can really bring in a different impact that if we follow that pattern, then I think we will be also doing the favor to the mother earth. With these words, I will say, lastly, I will only say, let us do at the end of this exercise, before the corona goes away, because there's no indication it's going to go away so fast. It might be lingering on for some time. It may revive again. Whatever the case may be, let's do the SWOT analysis. That what are the strengths in, that we had during this period? What were the weaknesses? And opportunities is only one. That you can uh, have more security of the country. You can have more sovereignty of the countries. And countries could be self-reliant. When they are self-reliant, I think the conflicts between the countries will also reduce. And our energies will not be directed against each other, but against the enemies like hunger, and uh, uh, diseases. Thank you very much. If there's any other questions, all the questions that I will answer at the end, but if there's any now, I'm very happy to answer it. Thank you very much. Uh, you could Thank mute you. your uh, speaker now. Yes. Uh, yes. Member, um, now. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Now, Nisan Mehman Sahib has laid down a huge canvas of issues that come around with the environment. And the interesting point that he made was also that you know, it affects the political environment too, the way they, these things have evolved. Uh, I'm sure there will be several queries and questions about that, uh, but uh, hold them uh, till you get there and you could type in. Meanwhile, all those who are listening, if you have any questions, but let me now turn to Rafael, now to you, to um, look at the aspects that you would like to cover. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Banuri, and thank you. Uh, to uh, the Center for organizing this webinar. It's uh, great fun to be able to participate. Um, I was meant to be in Pakistan, in fact, a couple of weeks ago, but of course, because of current events, I haven't been able to travel anywhere. So I'm just sitting here in sweaty Singapore. But thank you for the invitation to come and talk to you. So I just want to make a few points about the kind of Belt and Road Initiative uh, more generally and how I see the kind of impact of uh, COVID-19 playing out within that particular context. Um, I'll touch a little bit on CPEC, but um, I think I'm going to talk in quite general terms about the BRI and try to dig into some specific examples. But, you know, because we're talking about projecting forwards, it's quite difficult to know exactly what's going to happen. And so I'll try to touch really on some sort of trends, but I'd be happy to go back and pick up on anything specific later. I think the one uh, issue which uh, I think has already been kind of hinted at, which I think is probably going to be true more generally of uh, the world post uh, COVID-19, is a kind of acceleration of a lot of trends that we saw happening already. So a lot of issues that we'd really already seen playing out um, are going to just sort of be happening at a much greater speed. Now, this is not in some ways a new phenomenon. You could argue that the sort of uh, the way the world is structured and working over the past few years has tended towards acceleration in general. Uh, you know, and I think it's partially the way we all communicate, the way the fact that we're able to have this kind of a dialogue together now uh, in live time across uh, continents um, is something that was unthinkable time ago. And so everything's sort of getting compressed and accelerated. And so that acceleration is going to get sped even faster uh, with uh, what we're seeing happening around COVID-19. And so when we think about the BRI within that context, it's useful to think about what was happening with the BRI as we were going in to uh, the current healthcare crisis. And I would argue that the big trends with BRI was a general, um, a slight slowdown in some ways. Um, and an attempt to focus a little bit more. So whereas China really was talking about BRI in every direction, everywhere, all at the same time, you were starting to see a trend for China to try to focus a little bit more, try to bring it a bit more down to earth, try to slow things down a little bit, and realizing that in a way, the way they painted the canvas of BRI was probably a bit too broad for them to be able to manage. And so I think what we'll see going forwards is kind of an acceleration of some of those trends and patterns. So within Pakistan, for example, and CPEC, you see that there was a big discussion towards renegotiation. There's a big push towards trying to get some of the socioeconomic aspects of projects going a bit more. Uh, there was a bit more sort of accountability maybe trying to come in. And I think you're going to see that trend accelerate. So to some projects will get dropped a little more rapidly. Some will get renegotiated. I think you're going to see this push in that direction a lot more uh, quickly um, happening as we go forwards. I think the other thing that's going to happen, which is going to be very difficult, um, I think, to entirely predict the exact impact of it, uh, but I think it's going to have an impact across the board, is the very practical one of the fact that 
you know, a lot of BRI is basically about China building and China having connections with countries abroad, and improving trade and connectivity and infrastructure. And that requires transfers across border. And that is going to be something that is going to be increasingly difficult to do with any sort of rapidity in the near to medium term future, I suspect. Um, even more so within a BRI context where you're going to have a situation where some countries are going to be able to come out from this COVID-19 crisis quicker than others. Um, and that means that those countries are going to start to say, well, okay, within our environment, we think that we've got control of what's happening with the virus and the spread of it. So we're going to be much more paranoid about contacts with others. So what does that mean for a project like BRI or projects that come under the BRI banner, which are inherently about people going across border, the movement of goods, the movement of people? You know, that's going to be inherently structured difficultly. So, for example, China seems to being able to feel like it can manage uh, COVID-19 within its own borders much more rapidly than we can see in other countries. So what does that mean, for example, in a country like Myanmar, which has been betting a lot on its sort of back and forth across the border with China, if the disease takes off with some sort of large you know, magnitude within a country like Myanmar, what's that gonna mean for China's willingness to try to push some of these projects forwards? It's gonna be very difficult for them to want to send their people, for them to want to allow the back and forth without knowing that they're not just gonna start bringing sort of reinfection back in with them. So I think that very practical issue is gonna be one that's gonna be with us for some time um, and is gonna really have an impact on some of the bigger vision ideas of BRI, which is about trade and transfer across borders. I think the other aspect which is going to be uh, interesting is that ultimately for BRI to work, it requires a certain level of uh, liquidity, a certain level of finance within China being able to flow either within the sort of Chinese system or outside China to try to improve, you know, to try to allow Chinese companies to go abroad, to build infrastructure, to improve trade and connectivity with neighboring countries. Well, I think that liquidity isn't going to totally go away. I think China's still got a lot of sort of liquid currency sloshing around. But I think China's going to find itself under a lot of pressure and Beijing will find that it has to spend a lot more of this at home than it did abroad. And it will become much harder, I think, for the Chinese government to sort of go around trumpeting large projects abroad that involve sort of large amounts of money getting spent elsewhere when you're going to see, you know, the impact of COVID-19 hit quite badly sort of across uh, China. So you're going to see a lot of pressure internally for China to try to spend some of this money at home and less interest and appetite to really just be sort of spending this money um, all over the world. And this is going to drive another problem within China, which we've already started to see to some degree, which is nationalism. And you can see Chinese nationalism is being very uh, aggressively stoked, uh, probably partially intentionally, but also partially unintentionally uh, within China already. We can see there are narratives coming out where, you know, this idea of China having, you know, not actually been the source of the virus in the first place. Uh, this sort of conspiracy theory, which is now circulating, that it actually came from somewhere else to China. Um, you know, and the fact that that narrative is getting rejected internationally is something that's going to anger Chinese people say, well, look, we, we didn't even produce this problem and we're getting still blamed for it. You can see this narrative of blaming foreigners already starting to creep in within China. And even worse, you can start to see stories circulating within uh, China that, you know, uh, they, some of the neighboring countries actually want to return to China um, in some sort of mysterious way. There's a series of articles which has been published from an institution in Xi'an, which was uh, circulating the idea that lots of neighboring countries, including some of the Central Asians, actually were part of China and wanted to return to China. And these articles were, you know, ones written by God knows who, uh, some bot factory or some factory in, uh, in, in Xi'an that was just trying to get sort of eyeballs attention to its site. But the Kazakh uh, people picked up on this and you saw them complaining about it to the point that the Kazakh Ministry of Foreign Affairs actually had to haul it, hauled in the Chinese embassy to complain to them about these articles being published. Now, I suspect, again, this is sort of rampant nationalism in China having a direct impact on its ability to have relations with its neighbors. And considering that relationship is really the core of the BRI from China's perspective, we can see that that problem is going to play out a greater going forwards. Um, but ultimately, I think from China's perspective, from Beijing in particular, um, and I think it's already been signaled really by China, you know, the BRI as a concept is going to continue. I mean, this is really Xi Jinping's big sort of foreign policy idea. You know, Chinese leaders like to have a big idea that they sort of have given to the world. You know, Deng Xiaoping's is a big opening. You know, um, uh, um, Jiang Zemin had his sort of march westward. You know, Xi Jinping's big idea is going to be 
you know, the Belt and Road Initiative. This is him bringing the world to China and China to the world. And this narrative is kind of the big one, which he's been kind of pushing forwards in his foreign policy. And you can already see that it's being pushed in a kind of COVID direction or a post-COVID direction in this discussion of the idea of the health Silk Road. You know, the idea that this is the new kind of articulation of the Belt and Road Initiative that China is using uh, to push out um, its kind of diplomacy, medical diplomacy in particular, around the world under the rubric of uh, the Health Silk Road, which kind of ties in nicely to the kind of broader Belt and Road Initiative narrative. And I think that is really going to be uh, the story of this going forward. For China, it's going to be the continuing foreign policy idea that they're going to continue to champion. But as I say, going back to the acceleration point that I started with, I think this is going to be a story of accelerating trends of what we saw happening before, which is China continuing to use the Belt and Road as its kind of all-encompassing narrative for everything, but at the same time, a sort of gentle slowdown and a desire to try to maybe rethink some of the projects that were going forwards and making sure that they're actually delivering the outcomes that Beijing really wants to see. So I'll maybe stop there um, and hand it over back to our moderator who will take it on to the next speaker. But thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you've laid out, uh, again, a very, very interesting uh, as, uh, understanding of this, the canvas as you see it. I, I, if I was to pick one takeaway from what you said, I would probably say that um, uh, while BRI would continue, but China uh, in particular and other states too would need to improvise. But let's hear our other views and then we will uh, go to the uh, part of the questions. I would now uh, give the floor to Dr. Fazana Bari. Um, kindly um, un unmute yourself, ma'am, and um, you have uh, the floor for 10 minutes. Right, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to this forum. Um, so I think I was uh, basically uh, wanted to briefly uh, talk about what is the gendered impact because I think the common perception is that uh, you know, this pandemic has does not discriminate basically against, um, you know, any uh, men, women or, um, you know, uh, people from belonging to different class backgrounds. So um, I think we have this kind of um, experience of various disasters, whether these are natural or man-made. Um, we have, I mean, there is there is a sufficient evidence around the globe um, that, um, that, that any disaster, you know, or any conflict or pandemic, these are not gender neutral. So in the context of Pakistan, what we are seeing, like there seems to be complete like uh, disregard uh, in terms of its, um, its impact on women, because um, what I see is uh, when you look at the COVID response right now, uh, it feels that uh, the centrality of basically women, you know, as um, as health workers, as well as, you know, uh, as caregiver, that is very much, you know, they are the center of this uh, response. So um, although there are, there's no doubt that there are more uh, men who are basically uh, dying, uh, uh, or there is the, the, there are higher rate of mortality amongst men, but as per social and economic, uh, I think implication are concerned, I, women are going to face much more uh, devastating impact, you know. So um, obviously with the lockdown, one of the things what we have clearly see that uh, uh, women who are, uh, uh, let me first talk about a little bit of, uh, you know, like the health sector, because we all know uh, this is the figure in, uh, globally and also in Pakistan, that almost 70% of women workforce like in the health sectors consist of, you know, women, so it's female nurses and uh, they are at the forefront to um, address this, uh, you know, to deal with the Corona uh, uh, virus patients. Um, so obviously that will put them at a high risk, you know, um, uh, to Corona as well. Similarly, when we look at the women within the families because of the lockdown situation, because the family uh, people are like, well, the close, schools are closed, the workplaces are closed. So people are like strapped within the within homes. There are, uh, so I think in terms of uh, uh, work, domestic work burden, uh, which is traditionally, of course, women are um, supposedly take care of the family because uh, I think as far our cultural frameworks, frameworks are concerned because of the sexual degree of labor, women are very much defined within the, you know, within the family and their roles are very much into the reproductive spheres, you know, so women are supposed to take care of the children, take care of the housework, um, uh, take care of elderly within the families. So obviously with this situation, I think if you look at the domestic burden, you know, that has, um, you know, that has increased tremendously as for women uh, 
uh, and the girls are concerned. Um, and I think another thing which is quite worrying because, and again, um, what we see there is kind of a global uh, sort of a spike in domestic violence. I think there's a lot of talk about that. And uh, um, also in Pakistan, I, uh, what we see there, especially some of these um, uh, NGO sectors uh, where there are some hotlines still operational, I think they are also reporting that there is quite a rise in terms of violence against domestic violence, you know, violence against women. Um, as you know, in any case, um, uh, the situation like in terms of sports services, in terms of um, uh, redressal mechanisms, they were very weak um, even prior to COVID-19. And now it seems that it's totally, uh, that, that sports structures are absolutely dysfunctional, it's not, not operating. So that left women very vulnerable. Uh, they are, they are standing with their, with, you know, with their abuser within the family and they can, they, they feel very vulnerable because they have no way um, to approach, you know, um, or to, uh, to outreach uh, any, uh, any, any uh, support or any help. So um, along with that, I think what we also feel um, there is completely in terms of health implications because uh, the entire health sector is now basically, um, uh, you know, uh, is, uh, is geared towards, uh, towards the uh, COVID response. And so the other services which are very much need needed, especially the reproductive and sexual health services um, are, uh, seems to be totally disappeared, you know, and I think that there is there is a danger. Um, we already had Pakistan already has a very high maternal and mortality rate. So the women who are maybe the pregnant uh, women, if they are not going to have any access to um, health services, I think there is a danger that the mortality rate might increase. Similarly, I think in terms of contraceptive, um, you know, lack of contraceptives may lead to also, um, you know, unwanted pregnancies and unsafe abortion because, as you know, Pakistan do not have, um, I mean, abortion is illegal in any case, you know. So I think that also this situation is also endangered women's physical safety, you know, further. Um, and uh, when it comes to like the, you know, um, sort of um, in terms of economic, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, because this uh, COVID-19 uh, is not only creating a health um, emergency, but also it is intersecting with other, um, you know, uh, phenomena, and it is um, it is also linked with the other multiple, you know, crises that include social and economic crises as well. So I think if you look at the economic situation, I feel that also is hitting women harder because the majority of Pakistani women work, you know, in the labor force, although. In the formal sector, they are 26%, but majority of women who are working in Pakistan, they are in the formal sector of the economy. And um, so obviously, I think the response right now uh, as for uh, the government response is, is mostly towards the towards those who are in the formal sector and the informal sector of, uh, of labor uh, is, being, is being neglected. So in that way, also women are losing their livelihoods and I don't think there is a kind of um, a, any kind of a gender uh, awareness um, as far as the policymakers are concerned. So, so what I'm saying to uh, to begin with, you you know, like there is clearly an evidence that um, this that uh, COVID nineteen is not is not gender neutral. It's not it's not every uh, affecting everyone in the same way. It is it has its own um, uh, you know differential impacts depending on people's you know pre-existing, you know, uh, social positioning, you know, based on gender, class, ethnicity, religion, so and so forth. So um, th that is, um, I think that is something which needs to be, needs to be recognized in the case of COVID-19 as well. Um, and then um, I, I very briefly would like to say that when, uh, uh, in terms of our policy makers, you know, the way they are looking at the issue, it seems, um, there, there is complete gender blindness. I mean, nobody's talking about, I think this whole gender equality agenda has gone on the back burner. Uh, it does not, it doesn't seem that as if, uh, and I think the kind of moment, little momentum which we had gained prior to COVID-19 in, ter in terms of gender equality or promoting gender rights, um, there, there is, it's going to be, um, you know, um, uh, that that momentum we are going to uh, to lose you know we are losing already and i i fear that even in post covid situation we, we will further we will further lose that so i think what is very important at this moment that 
we need to recognize, you know, as I said, if you look at the women's reproductive uh, roles and women's role within the within the economic sphere, in terms of like the, the majority of women in the health sector, in the services sector, which has got the most affected. Um, so uh, this needs to be um, sort of um, uh, recognized that women's role reproductive roles, which has never been recognized, or women's economic roles yeah, have not been recognized. Um, by neglecting that, um, we are not, we are, we are, we are ignoring them right now as well, you know, and it will have a huge negative implications, you know, for women to rebuild their lives. Uh, right now, also, um, you know, during the COVID, um, uh, you know, this this Corona virus phase. Uh, there is a much bigger risk to their physical and emotional um, health, but if also I think in the post is the post Corona uh, phase also um, with this this neglect uh, because this lack of gender awareness and gender uh, uh, integration of gender perspective. Uh, will have negative implication uh, for, for women to rebuild their lives as well. So I think what is very important for the policy maker that they should be fully um, integrate, you know, the gender perspective uh, into into policy making. We don't we don't have even uh, gender disaggregated data. They might have it, but they are not reporting. You know, when they are when they are reporting sort of the number of cases, infection cases or uh, mortality data, they do not give us um, a gender desegregated figure. And I think that's important to have that. And similar, um, and also I feel that it is um, uh, right now, as for the, as I said earlier on that, Women are in, in, at the at the center of dealing with the um, with the crisis, you know, in, as as a health workers as well as within the families. But I think women do not seems to be sitting at the table where the decisions are being made. As for the policy ma maker making is concerned, that is completely male dominated, and male domination is doesn't bother me as much if they if they are gender sensitized. But it's it seems that they don't there is there is no conversation. There is the gender discourse has basically um, i think fallen through the cracks and nobody's talking about that um it's, it's important that we recognize the centrality of women roles right now you know in economic and social production and um it's, it's equally important that the, uh, the administration the, the administration and the law enforcement agencies should consider domestic violence because it's like kind of a shadow pandemic, you know, so reaching women in distress should be classified as an also essential service during this time. And um, so I think uh, these are the issues which I feel in terms of digital um, divide also I would uh, I would say you know um, because there's a lot of work which is being now uh, women are asked to um, do um, uh, it, through 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 internet and through using this technology uh, media and technology and women there is a di digital divide in our country and women men are much more i think better equipped for tele teleworking than as compared to women so i think these are the um, skills which needs to be you know we need we, we need to build um, uh, for women we should particularly give uh, there should be some kind of um, you know uh, on on online um, training uh, for women who who are supposed to work i mean in someone like me i'm using this uh, zoom for the first time you know because um, I'm very old fashioned. I, you know, um, I mostly, you know, work in my office, read my books, hard um, papers and all that. So I think these are the new skills, you know, because if we have to rebuild this world as more equal, um, so then this gender perspective needs to be inco incorporated um, into, into all policy um, uh, intervention, policy initi initiatives right now. So thank I think I'll stop here, you know, yeah. yeah. Thanks, thanks so much. Kindly mute your uh, voice now. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so we have, again, uh, a very wide canvas that Dr. Bari has brought out. And I very, very quick takeaway would be that while the gender issues or the concerns existed anyway, now they are more sensitive and more issues and then the vulnerability has increased. That's the main message that we hear from, uh, from her. But hold your questions for that. Type them in. Um, all those who are interested. Um, meanwhile, we go to our last speaker, uh, the last but not the least, uh, Mr. Zarar Khuru, um, who will take a much broader global perspective to uh, the post-COVID-19 world. You have the floor, sir. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, to just uh, pick up on uh, something that Mr. Pantucci said, 
um, about the challenges to uh, China. I mean, certainly uh, the internal challenges uh, and uh, potential problems that uh, will arise in the future, I think he's identified them very well. Let's take a look now at what that entails, say all entails for China on a global uh, stage. And here I am uh, drawing a comparison with the United States. Now, one thing that came up, and Benoli Sab, you uh, spoke about it in your introduction, and um, Raffaello also touched upon it, is the word accelerant or accelerator. We are going to see, I think, globally much of what we are already seeing, but faster and far more intense. Um, for example, um, ever since the Trump government came into place, we have been witnessing a gradual abdication of the United States global role, not just a unwilling, not an unwilling abdication, I mean, a determined abdication. Um, I think the most recent example would be the decision, uh, the shocking decision, frankly, to cut uh, funding for the World Health Organization. Now, just while you guys were talking, I just uh, read a news item that China is now going to be contributing $30 million more to the WHO. So you see nature um, and geopolitics both abhor a vacuum, right? You give space, somebody will take it. We have also been seeing in uh, a what you may want to call medical diplomacy on the part of uh, China. We are also seeing that when there are calls for global debt relief, um, People are now talking as much to China as they are to the United States because, say, take the case of Africa. I think China holds uh, the lion's share of the debt on that continent. Now, the question, of course, is that can a China, which we are also seeing is uh, largely using nationalism to uh, replace communism as a central uniting ideology, can a arguably insular China step up to that role? That is something um, that, and I hate to use this term, but unfortunately I have to, something that remains to be seen, right? Now, um, now let's let's narrow the focus a little bit, um, or actually a lot. Um, what Dr. Bari just said about the gen, the virus in fact does in fact discriminate. Now she um, primarily mentioned a gender. I would like to expand that if I may to socioeconomic strata. Uh, the virus discriminates against uh, uh, along socioeconomic lines as well. Um, take a look at the room I'm sitting in right now, right? This is a room in which in many parts of Karachi, the city where I live, entire families live, right? Um, the more congested an area, and this is borne out by data and evidence now because Leari is emerging as one of the hotspots for infection in Karachi, and how could it not? When you have people living in congested environments, um, sometimes six to a room, we can talk about social distancing all we want. It's not going to happen. Um, in addition to that, I was just reading a report and, um, you know, I can't stand by these figures, but they serve as a sort of, um, you know, a broad estimate that say that close to 30 to 40 percent of Pakistani households do not have access to soap. And what do we keep saying? What have we been saying since day one? Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Great. How do you do that if you don't have soap? Right. So the virus, I am far more insulated, thanks to my economic privilege, from the virus than the vast majority of Pakistanis are. Now let's expand that across the world. Let's go to the United States, where we see that um, I think about 60 to 70 percent of COVID-19 fatalities are among the African-American and the Hispanic communities. Again, because of their lower socioeconomic positioning, because like in Pakistan, these are also people who tend to work in the field that have to continue. I mean, um, you know, uh, cleaning, sanitation, um, uh, the, the, the food industry, so on and so forth. And also due to their economic compulsions, perhaps you, uh, I can, perhaps uh, all of you may also be able to weather this shock, right? for a couple of months. There are people who can't even weather the economic shock for a couple of days. So it's not like they are not aware of the virus or the danger it entails, but they have to go out and put themselves in a position where they can potentially become infected and then spread the infection further. So I think that in many ways, um, the virus will act as an accelerant to class uh, attitudes as well. You may see a time um, which comes to be like, oh, so you've come from that neighborhood. I don't want to be with you because that is a coronavirus red zone. So you'll see that kind of discrimination sweeping in. 
Now let's come to racial discrimination. Um, Raffaello correctly pointed out the kind of attitudes and narrative that are emerging in uh, China. But also let's bear in mind that these are largely also emerging as a reaction to other reactions. For example, the United States administration, very early on, President Trump called it the Chinese coronavirus. Then they're calling it the Wuhan coronavirus. They're also, believing it, believe it or not, calling it Kung flu, which is a clearly racist play on words. You see, we have seen Chinese uh, 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 or in fact Asian uh, people being targeted in the United States, victims of racial abuse. We've seen that happening in, the, in, in uh, Europe as well. And um, basically, these attitudes already existed, right? They are now being given free reign and aided and abetted by the narrative from the leadership itself. Um, you cannot find a better example of weaponizing the coronavirus against a minority population as in India today. Because um, the arguably fascist regime of uh, Narendra Modi, I mean, Muslims have been the whipping boy for a very long time. Um, there are dog whistles, there are uh, coordinated pogroms, and now the virus itself has been weaponized to, uh, as a tool to further suppress the Muslim population. Because what we're seeing is that the entire focus was on the Tablighi Jamaat, which had a gathering of 4,000. But there were other gatherings of 50,000, 60,000, which are not Muslim gatherings, which were completely ignored. Then along with that, you've seen the weaponization of fake news. Along with that, you have seen the co-opting, willing co-opting of uh, mainstream media platforms to spread that very narrative. Now the narrative already existed. This just virus just gave a, it an, uh, gave an opportunity to accelerate it, to further, uh, uh, to sort of surgically target. And there are historical precedents for this sort of thing. Um, take Nazi Germany and how typhus was weaponized against the Jewish community to create a narrative that, oh, this is a dirty community, they're spreading disease which is one of the reasons why they were then walled up in the Warsaw Ghetto. You go further back in history, you will find the same phenomenon taking place during the Black Plague. You want to go all the way back to the Plague of Athens, you will see it happening. Then, of course, you have um, the dictators, autocrats, and wannabe dictators and autocrats of the world. And here I'm going to talk about Hungary's Viktor Orban, who in any case have been, has been riding roughshod over democratic principles ever since he came into power. And then lo and behold, here this virus descends from heaven or, you know, from a wildlife market or a bat, if you prefer. And it gives him the perfect opportunity to do what he's always wanted to do. He, um, uh, in a parliament that he dominates, he had himself voted emergency powers um, with the uh, provision that anyone criticizing or, uh, the government's approach to coronavirus, well, that's fake news and you're in jail for five years. Now, I'm sure Viktor Orban would love a world in which this virus continues for years because then the state of emergency will never, ever go away. You're seeing that in Phil Philippines with Duterte. You're seeing that across the board. Coming back again to the United States, I mean, um, uh, Nisan Maiman Saab was talking about the political divides in Pakistan, and certainly uh, they are unhelpful to say the least. But then you take a look at what Trump is tweeting, liberate Michigan liberate Virginia. Um, and you have armed protesters in those states calling coronavirus a conspiracy, saying that the lockdown is communism. So you'll see, I mean, again, um, you always had this sort of very uh, libertarian anti-vaxxer community in the United States. But now, thanks to this global pandemic, this global crisis, I think that the, our worst impulses are coming to the fore. And as far as the world post-corona, I mean, crystal gazing is a, is, a, is a tricky proposition at best, but I think you are looking at an increasingly insular world, um, especially when you look at the fact, uh, the unfortunate fact that both global and regional organizations have really failed um, in this particular crisis. How much have we heard from the UN? Um, the European Union's reaction was flailing. There were some tensions between Italy and the European Union. SARC is non-existent. And uh, the WHO has itself come under criticism. So I think that, um, again, a lot depends on 
how long this uh, particular pandemic continues and what kind of devastation it wreaks. But I think that the world that coronavirus will leave in its wake will be a darker one. And that's just the virus. Now, if we look at projections, and this is the IMF talking, I mean, um, certainly they know more than I do about these things. The IMF is saying that you are looking at the worst global recession slash depression since the 1930s. Well, how did, how did that end? The, the Great Depression of the 1930s, I think, is a singular accelerator for fascism in Europe. And that ended in World War II and the deaths of millions. Um, I pray we're not going to see a similar situation. Uh, I hope we don't, but hope uh, is not a strategy. And I think that looking at historical trend lines and looking at the direction in which the world was going in the first place, I think we're going to get to where we were going to get but a hell of a lot sooner than we wanted to. Ji Khalid, sir. Well, thank you very much. Again, uh, many issues that come up in, uh, in, uh, in the way one can look at this. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all those who are listening in, I'm sure there are several uh, uh, comments or questions that you have, and we have, we have quite a few. Let me, let me uh, throw in a couple of questions that uh, Nisar Mehman saw first on uh, since you know i believe uh, he may need to leave a few minutes earlier than uh, the others so um, let me let me ask you memans how there are two questions that i have for you right away the first one is from uh, dr Sultan malik it says that um, can the 18th amendment be overridden in case of such national level emergencies and are there many institutions or policy frameworks when it comes to natural disasters or emergencies. So yet, why isn't there a uh, cohesive and coordinated response? How can these kind of gaps be addressed? And uh, bear with me for the second question to uh, Mehman Saab uh, from Rida Anwar from this institute. Um, uh, how can we preserve the positive changes made in the carbon emissions and in the environmentally, uh, environment generally in the post COVID 19 future. You have the floor, sir, for, for to the answer. Thank you, Khalza. I think uh, basically, if you look at the pandemic situation, all actions that are to be taken is at the grassroots level. One is a policy, and the policy is frankly a very limited option. Number one option was whether to go shut, uh, have a uh, total uh, closed down and uh, you know and locked down people or not and those of the countries which did lock down quickly and uh, china was excellent example and there because of the enforcement they could do because their system was authoritarian let's face it and they had the means they had the technology their movement was also monitored so anybody could not leave and they could do that with that kind of a thing it was at the grassroots. Now, when we say, let's leave for the moment the 18th Amendment, what are we saying? What we are saying is leave the set of constitution. It's a part of the constitution. Now, constitution is nothing but the rules governing the whole thing. The governance is that there will be a federal government which will sign the policy. Then there will be provincial governments. They will execute it, but they will execute through the local government. And I think we have all the systems. Let's not create a new system. I know that NDMA is there. They have done a fine job. But then NDMA is also decentralized in the sense that there are PDMAs in the provincial and they are at the level. So I think there is just no need to open up the issues that we have settled. And these are the constitutional issues. Constitution is a rule of book, which has just like in Islam, you have a Quran, which it decides, which guides us how to conduct our life. Similarly, in countries, there's a constitution and rule of law. So rule of law does say, and I will come back to what Farzana Bari said, uh, very rightly there is the rules, uh, clearly there's the human rights, the women rights are there, but are we listening to it? Are we implementing it? I think the whole point is let's not deviate, let's not create new uh, arenas to fight on. There is a system and you don't create parallels. For example, I give you what we have left. I, when I was young, there was a scouts and there was the civil defense. All of those emergencies were there. We left them. Why did we leave them? There still could be the scouts and the civil defense. These are at the local level. Now, if you're distributing the food, if you're giving the money, 
where do, where do you don't send it right from the account to account only that fine in some cases is possible but when you go and distribute to the people you have to go to the grassroots and therefore i don't think there's a need for anything to do with the 18th amendment or stay with the rules the system allows you to do this and allow the system to work don't create new rules because you'll only create confusion and also you will create mixed signal and one of the things that i we talked about is that uh, unity and this unity is affected by lack of proper effective communication i think if you are communicating from the federation then you're communicating from the uh, provinces and in communication i mean frankly zarar is the expert and i have my experience of experience uh, of being in the communication there should be one representative one voice with a spokesperson how many do you see how many spokesperson we have eight of them in fact federal government and then the whole thing comes to defend when it comes to the provinces there are again those so i would say the systems let's follow the systems and sarma malik ke liye main ye kahunga ki please look at it there's no such thing emergency is there the emergency is the global situation let the federal government provide the fund negotiate with the requirements and i would not say like in uh, us it's a very funny situation the in new york governor is negotiating separately then the governor of michigan and the prices are rising and i would say frankly let's not create that federal government is there let them uh, take care of the global policy and if they say either there will be a lockdown or there will not be now you can't have it's like saying you are, i'm sorry to say but i'll say you are pregnant or you're not a pregnant you cannot do a, a lockdown and not lockdown and i think look at what germany today is opening up after very severe lockdown we don't even know when we are started and so on so i think uh, and then we are talking about the lives versus the a, a, a jobs i think if there's a life then only there can be jobs so that's my view on the other thing what we do on the climate change i think uh, right now frankly uh, since the cop 15 in paris agreement americans walked out and now americans are walked out of who it seems that i agree with that rather it seems that everybody is now focused in word americans have always in the history if you look at the history of america there are times when they have uh, been inward looking and from time to time they are again doing the fight but therefore i use the word that let's have the self sufficiency the food and everything you can't depend on anybody but your own self so the growers are in there and let's be fair to them i think we are not implemented the system in the normal way but right now as i said we can leap frog missing something we just go for example this communication we are doing this communication i may have a little problem of connecting but fair enough we are finally there so so i think we should leave from for development again for the people and i also agree with what zarar uh, koro said about the tendency of the uh, fascism controlling yes but these are the point but then the people have to be vigilant people have really have to guard again all of such trends uh, that's but these are historic trends in each of the country i think pakistan is far away from those fascism and far away from authoritarianism and it is being challenged look at this look at the fact that the one confused message come from the federation then the provinces in city of karachi or in sindh or whatever other places in punjab lahore also they are not implementing they are not implementing the laws so in a country like this i think it's very difficult to come back and say we are going to be authoritarian let's have one message clear messages of the total leadership sitting together and saying this is what our view and that is where the unity i think unity of command all the people who in the forces will understand better and you will understand that unity of command is important we did not right. show that and i think right now what we have let's carry practicing that into for the unity and reap the benefits of the environment thank you yeah yeah thank you so much it's um, very very i will stay i i think it's so i'm learning and therefore i put okay. my engagement to 5 o'clock so we will all be together okay. well, that's very, also very good to hear the other yeah that's very good to hear now um, um, may i may i request the panel um, all the panelists at uh, you can see the questions that are being brought in yes so uh, while i will go through a round of couple of questions to each in the order that we we had those questions 
but whenever uh, you're covering, if there is something that you think that you want to pick from any of the questions from there, or make a comment from uh, anything else that you need noticed, feel free to do that. My request is that let's be very, very brief so that uh, we can accommodate several and you see, you can see there's so much of interest. Now, Rafael, let me, let me bring in uh, two questions to you. Um, uh, the first one, which actually came right almost when we, you were already speaking is from Zaki Khalid, um, who says that Chinese analysts continue to argue that COVID-19 will accelerate great power competition between the US and China. Do you see this impacting the maritime component of uh, Belt and Road Initiative? So that's one question that I would like to, to consider. And another one from Dr. Adil Sultan, who says that BRI may see some setback with more internal focus by China, but looking from the Chinese perspective, uh, COVID-19 has provided an opportunity to make inroads in the Western Alliance. Uh, Neiman Sab, could you please uh, put the mic on? Yeah. Uh, uh, so let me continue. Um, so, uh, so if if uh, you know if Western Alliance, he basically mentions Italy and Spain, especially once the U.S. seems to uh, have failed in its leadership uh, test by helping its allies through uh, this existential crisis. So, why don't you take these questions and any um, you know, we we go through one round and perhaps I can ask for another round of questions. You have the floor. Sir. Sure. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, fascinating comments by uh, other colleagues on the panels. And I, I, I agree 100 percent that I'm learning a lot as well from this. So I appreciate uh, the opportunity. But um, so in brief, those two questions, I think that um, I think that to, to tackle the second one first, I mean, I, I, I think the Chinese are trying to make their medical diplomacy help them make inroads in Europe in particular. I don't think it's working, frankly. I really don't think it's working because the narrative, if you read um, the European press in particular, is one of faulty machines, faulty equipment coming from China. Um, you know, you, the, the idea actually seems to go in the other direction. The narrative in Europe at the moment on China is, is a fairly negative one, and it's getting more negative. Where you are seeing positive views coming out is frankly in the places you would expect. Um, and it's places that, you know, have always had some sort of issue maybe with their central government. Um, or have always been sort of inclined towards China for one reason or another. So, you know, for example, if we look at a country like Serbia, uh, which has always had a very fractious relationship with the EU, you know, uh, the leadership there, frankly, used, um, you know, used uh, China's medical diplomacy to basically say, oh, China's our wonderful ally, whereas, you know, the Europeans are not, which is nonsense, because, by the way, the Europeans have built the Serbian healthcare infrastructure and have spent a huge amount of money there already. You know, and so in fact, the realities are very different. And there, what was the Serbian government doing? Well, the Serbians have a very fractious relationship with Brussels, and this is just another way to kind of kick them. You know, in Italy, you can see the the, the part of the Italian government that's been shouting about how wonderful, uh, you know, the Chinese medical diplomacy was, is the same part of the government which frankly has a problem with uh, Brussels. You know, so it's kind of an opportunity in a way to have a go at their sort of classic enemy. In fact, what you've really seen is, you know, the, the public mood has definitely shifted against China and it's been exacerbated, frankly, by some of these sorts of stories we see emanating about, you know, China uh, denying that the virus ever came from them. Um, you know, some of these, uh, some of the faulty, uh, faulty, um, faulty equipment stories. And, you know, so I actually think China's medical diplomacy isn't delivering what they were hoping to uh, deliver. Now, I don't think that's a positive thing, by the way. I think, you know, frankly, the most uh, sober and proper responses I've seen to China's medical diplomacy have been from a few leaders like Angela Merkel, who sort of turned around and said, just, you know, thank you for sending this stuff. Uh, we appreciate it. You know, we hope you enjoyed the stuff we sent you before. And, you know, it's just a very sort of sober realization. But I think the problem in Europe at the moment is the mood is going very against China. And in, in some ways, it, the pendulum is swinging too far, I would argue. In reality, China is both an ally and an adversary at the same time. And you have to find a way of kind of treading that middle ground. And unfortunately, at the moment, the public mood is pushing it in the other direction. And unfortunately, some of what we're seeing coming out of Beijing isn't helping that. Um, so that's my brief comment on that one. Um, I think in terms of the first one, uh, to look specifically at, at the, the Maritime Silk Road, how it's going to accelerate that competition, I think it, it, it is. It's going to cause the same problems that we saw happening, just more, you know. And that, that problem, in a way, is one of um, this push by... Uh, by the United States to try to brand all kind of BRI activity as debt trap diplomacy that, you know, these countries should be rejecting because, you know, prima facie it's China and therefore it's sort of negative. 
And the truth is that in a lot of these countries, they would like the investment and they actually see a positive side to it. And so they will find themselves, I think, getting pushed even harder to try to reject this uh, without necessarily having a kind of alternative offered on the table. Um, and these countries will find themselves in, in a way in a harder fix than they did before. You know, before you already had this kind of narrative rumbling along where, you know, the United States is pushing people to choose our side or their side. Um, I think that's only going to get sharper in uh, the kind of post a COVID world, if we ever get to a post-COVID world, I forget which one of my eminent panelists mentioned this, but you know, it's actually hard to know exactly when we're really going to get to a confident place where we can say we're in a post-COVID world. But um, you know, I think that in as the kind of chips slow down, as we see the kind of realities of the world shaping out, I think you'll start to see that kind of with us or against us narrative getting pushed even more aggressively. And I think for countries along the Maritime Silk Road, that is going to be a very uh, a sort of pronounced issue, in particular because I think China is is putting a lot in to the Maritime Silk Road and some of the sort of port infrastructure investment it's doing around the world. So I'll leave it at that. I did see there were some other questions, but I'll let the moderator steer us as to when I should answer those. Yeah. Okay. We will we will uh, take another round and perhaps you would also meanwhile look at those questions. Now um, let me let me bring out a question to Dr. Fazan Abari now. Um, uh, this is from your QAU fraternity. <laughs> um, you mentioned about the non-availability of data, and data was an important point that you made, um, uh, data as well as information, but is there any read into what kind of healthcare or safe environment is being provided to women who are either pandemic affected or require healthcare other than the maternity or childcare? Uh, so other areas in that, so uh, uh, that's one area to think of. And let me throw in another question on uh, on, to, on this uh, issue of um, how do you see the impact of, let's say, a post-COVID-19 world? Would the number of working women increase or decrease in your in your uh, uh, sensibility? You have the floor, madam. You need to unmute your uh, uh, mic. You need to unmute your mic. All right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there you are. So I said, let me take you. Please repeat what you Yeah. Second question first. Um, you know, you asked me. I mean, what will be the impact? Because if you, um, I think, in terms of, um, uh, it, it's very obvious. You know, the kind of economic crisis the world will face. Um, and Pakistan economy, as you know, was already doing very badly, you know, even before the COVID. And uh, apparently, um, the you know, uh, economist estimates are that that might go into a negative growth. Um, so in, in, in that context, of course, with the increasing poverty, um, at one level, I'll see it will push everybody to come into the uh, job market to look for, you know, some kind of a job livelihood in order to sustain their living. But on the other hand, what I'll see that there is a lot of, you know, that women have been like this the, uh, uh, in the formal sector of the economy, um, and especially where the uh, women are mostly uh, in the informal sector or the contract uh, laborers, I think they there will be, uh, you know, uh, he, there will be a negative impact. And I don't, th I think they probably, uh, even in the formal sector, uh, women's presence will be reduced. So I, I could see that in the formal sect in sector of the economy, um, women might be losing um, uh, more jobs, they'd be laid off. But, uh, but on the other hand, in the informal sector, I see them, you know, probably will be again struggling, you know, a lot more uh, to um, get back to some kind of access to, to livelihood, uh, you know. Uh, so that, that I th think will be going to be the situation. Um, as for, um, you know, uh, right now, the, the availability of data, Pakistan um, has doing little better than before in terms of like we have now several databases and uh, where there is a gender desegregation uh, is taking place. But uh, I think as for um, COVID-19, like coronavirus uh, effects are concerned, uh, we, I have not seen any data. Uh, probably, um, you know, this uh, national command uh, uh, 
you know, uh, that uh, outfit probably is keeping data, you know, gender wise data or in terms of age, I'm sure, because they do discuss, talk about the age structure. So probably they have a data, but we don't get to see that. And I think it is, it is important to have um, disaggregated data by gen gender and all, as well as by age, because obviously when you do the planning, you know, for the, to, uh, for the re, um, rebuilding um, uh, re and giving a kind of a um, rebuilding support to people, I think that data then can, can um, uh, help you. Uh, in terms of, um, I think the healthcare services, I, as, as far I know, the, because in Islamabad, I'm quite sort of in touch with um, all, um, all Pakistan Young Nurses Association, you know, also apparently um, the other services have been come to halt. Um, and, um, you know, especially um, reproductive uh, health services are, doesn't seem to be now, you know, available. Um, so, um, so I, I think in, in that in that way, uh, you, uh, women will be women health will suffer more because the reproductive health or the need for contraceptions or need for um, you know if the, for the pregnant post prenatal postnatal sort of services if that those are not available I think and as you know that the maternal mortality rate is in any case very high in Pakistan because of you know there are number of reasons because that you know um, sometimes you know uh, repeated pregnancies or also women are malnourished forty percent are women are actually uh, uh, anemic, they suffer from iron deficiency and so on and so forth. So as a result of that, we are, we are all, already, you know, Pakistan is one of those countries where we have the highest uh, maternal mortality rate in the region. Um, so in that sense of these services, um, I, I suppose there is a danger that that uh, mortality rate will, uh, will also rise. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for these uh, comments. Uh, now we have, um, you know, a significant number of questions, but let me let me now turn to uh, Zarar Khodosab uh, and and again uh, throw in two questions to you. Uh, in a, to begin with, uh, the first is from uh, a researcher here at this institute, Mr. Zaki Khalid. Again, do you see increased state surveillance being legitimized under the garb of public health monitoring? I think his question is more on the intent of it rather than. Uh, the other way around. And, and I, question for, uh, from uh, Mr. Hamraz, I'm an interesting name. Uh, <laughs> uh, do you see the coronavirus discriminating along the traditional lines of global north and south? And in what ways? And in the interesting example that he's taking, I think, is that the US is likely to issue corona immunity certificates soon, not allow people to participate in public life. What kind of discrimination could all this bring on? So very, very useful mm. You have the floor. Well, okay. Well, uh, to address uh, Mr. Zaki Khalid's uh, question, absolutely yes. Uh, and this is with regard to state surveillance. I think that not only is it going to be expanded, I think that at least in the short term, it will be welcomed as well. I mean, and again, we're already seeing that happen. We're already seeing that happen. We're seeing that happening. I mean, China was doing it anyway. Again, which comes and brings us back to the whole accelerant uh, argument is that China was doing it anyway, and now they have QR codes. Um, now, the thing is that, again, it's hard to argue against that right now, isn't it? Um, in the sense that, well, it is a public health issue. It is a global emergency. So uh, in exceptional times, exceptional uh, steps need to be taken. It's just that once those steps are taken, they're never taken back. And we've seen that. We've seen that, uh, we've seen that in the war on terror. Um, which government that accrued uh, emergency powers to itself ever gave it back. No one ever gives up power. And uh, it's, it's very addictive power, you know, it's, it's, it's like the cocaine of governance, <laughs> you know, you can't have enough, you can never have enough. And um, you're seeing it in, um, you're seeing it in China, you're seeing it in Russia, you're going to see it to some extent or the other all over the world. And um, you will see that as in the case of Hungary, which I mentioned earlier, um, you know, unfortunately, I have to use a Star Wars quote here. This is how democracy dies amid thunderous applause. So <laughs> we can hear the applause now. And I don't think it's going to be ending anytime soon. Um, as far as the next question goes, do I see coronavirus discriminating along the traditional lines of global north and south? Not at the moment. But that time too will come. And I think that time will come when we go into vaccine production. Uh, um, 
because it a lot of it depends on who comes up with the vaccine first. If it's big pharma, well, they're going to price it accordingly unless there's some kind of global convention on this, which um, I doubt if there will be. Um, and then you're going to see that really the richer countries are going to grab it first. I mean, I think Mr. Nassar Maimon was pointing towards that. If you look at what's happening in, internally in the United States, you have one governor bidding against another governor for limited medical resources. If they're doing that inside their own country, right, what do you think they're going to do when a vaccine comes out? America is going to throw money at it. They're going to outbid everybody else. They're going to try and accrue those uh, uh, that particular resource for themselves. Uh, you've already seen Trump doing it. You've seen cases in which they've outbid uh, uh, France and various other countries, I think, on uh, supplies, medical supplies, ventilators, masks, so on and so forth. So I see no reason why that's not going to continue. And then, of course, there is one, um, again, when I was talking about socioeconomic discrimination, I was talking in terms of neighborhoods. Let's expand that to a global level, shall we? Um, countries with stronger economies will, of course, be able to weather the storm better. Countries with weaker economies, like Pakistan, will not be able to. You can see that we've already lifted lockdown um, restrictions. Now, one could argue the merit of that. But... Um, we had to do it, uh, the argument is, because we cannot sustain the economic shock, right? Other countries can. Um, Italy, you know, I mean, may not have the most, you know, killer economy in Europe, but nevertheless could be able to sustain a month-long lockdown, lockdown far more than any country in the developing world ever could. Then, um, as far as the next part of that question, which obviously I think is a separate question, Corona immunity certificates. Well, of course, I mean, you can call it a plague pass. And again, this brings me back to the thing that certain neighborhoods will be discriminated against. And it just so happens that those also are minority neighborhoods. So you're seeing um, an overlap of fault lines now, aren't you? And you are seeing that the fault lines that already exist are going to become deeper. And um, Forget about the United States, you're going to see that right here in Pakistan. I mean, for example, if Leari turns out to be a hotbed of infection, what happens to those people from Leari who work as domestic workers, say, in Clifton and Defense? Do you think anyone's going to let them in? I don't think so. So, again, um, you know, I hope I'm wrong, I pray I'm wrong, but I don't see any of this ending well at all. Uh, thanks. Um... Now, uh, we have time for uh, a quick another round of questions. So let me let me now uh, bring out a question from this is from Air Marshal Ashfaq. Um, uh, he, he has this elaborate question and I would uh, it is to the whole panel so anyone can respond. Uh, I would, however, uh, also um, uh, seek indulgence of Dr. Bari to uh, look at this question from a gender perspective also within Pakistan. Uh, the question says it requires a collective effort to minimize the loss of life as well as effects on the economy world over. What we are seeing is a blame game between countries as well as sometimes within discriminations within the countries. Um, uh, like at Len, and the example that is taking is India uh, and national interest taking over joint action. So his question is that what about these kind of alliances? How do they sustain and can these trends uh, and the, would the world be able to fight the uh, pandemic and uh, the calamities effectively? I mean, the question about how much of globalization or cooperation will be left thereafter. Uh, so uh, from, from the domestic gender community uh, perspective, Dr. Bari, and anyone from the panel who wants to take the broad, broader global, global question. Uh, yeah, you need to uh, un unmute your mic, madam. Dr. Bari Pehaya. Ji. Yes. So, um, is this question? Um, I didn't I didn't quite get it. I think. Uh, yeah. What What is the question? The question is about uh, uh, hmm. for, from your perspective. Right. Uh, within uh, the communities, uh, there, uh, do you see kind of discriminations like, like in India? Uh, right. And is there a gender perspective to that? 
Yes, yes, sure, sure. I think definitely, I think any, dis because, you know, if you look at the larger socioeconomic uh, political context of the of the countries, you know, where, or of the world, as well as within the countries, there are so many disparities, you know, along the line, lines of, of course, gender, class, and other social deviance. So I think all of, um, so whenever there is a crisis, whether it is a conflict or a natural disaster or a pa pandemic, of course, it is, it, it's impacts, you know, um, it has a very differential impact, you know, depending um, uh, people's own uh, social prior social positioning, you know. So certainly, I think in um, in in the in uh, in the context of Pakistan, we already seeing that, you know, the, the way it has been affecting uh, people, um, uh, especially um, uh, who come from the low uh, low middle uh, or, or a working class background. Um, uh, People who are living in Kachi Abadis, you know, like um, they, it will be, it is, it's, it's very hard for them. And from, I think, from the gender perspective, um, um, also uh, women will, uh, women arts, as I earlier said, are um, affected very differently, you know, uh, because they are losing, um, they they are overburdened uh, in terms of like. Um, you know, in terms of the, their own domestic responsibility, reproductive roles, as well as um, you know their role in the in the in the health sector. So I am. So I, I think certainly um, if, uh, it is going to be it, it is going to have a differential uh, dif differential impact. You know, and also of course not on all women because all women um, not all women women are not kind of a unitary category. So it will be particularly women who belong to the working class backgrounds. I think they will they will they are suffering more and they will suffer more even um, you know. Uh, even the situation, you know, um, uh, situations to come because I don't see this um, uh, a pandemic is going to go away in 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 near uh, in near future. So um, yeah, I, I would say certainly there is there is a dimension, you know, class and a gender dimension to uh, how people are, you know, be getting affected by the by the by the pandemic. Yeah, thanks. Anyone else from the panel who would like to um, respond? We've lost Nassar Mehmanov for uh, due to a technical glitch, but he'll be rejoining. Uh, so the rest I of think, you. Uh, I think the question has largely been addressed uh, thus far. Um, I mean, it is, however, I mean, I'll just uh, briefly add that it is a rather tragic irony that at a time when, in fact, you need greater global cooperation, right? Uh, I mean, greater cooperation within countries and greater cooperation between countries is the exact same time when the exact opposite seems to be happening. So again, um, I mean, why, why, one can only mourn that uh, really and, uh, you know, hope for the best, but as per always, uh, expect the absolute worst. Thanks. Um, uh, Rafaelo, there are a couple of questions, unless you want to also, you can chip in to this one as well, if you like. But there are a couple sure. of questions that I have for you um, that, sure. uh, you know, that perhaps I can uh, give them to you uh, both together. Uh, one from Sajad Ahmed. What would be the best strategy for both Pakistan and China to manage the time framework for BRI projects after the pandemic as there's already a delay? And you did refer to in your presentation to the aspects of it will slow down. So perhaps the extent of it. And the other is how do you see okay. the, the military landscape uh, in the post-COVID-19 world. Rafael, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I mean, I think um, uh, on the last one, I, I think I'd agree with uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Kershaw. I mean, it's. It, I think a lot of it's been touched on. Uh, this question of divisions and globalization being negatively impacted in this way, um, and it kind of ties into one of my answers to one of these. But to answer those two specific questions in turn, I think on the on, on the delays in CPEC one, I think frankly. Um, in my mind, there was always a sense that CPEC was moving probably a little too fast, and I didn't quite understand what the rush was all the time. Um, there seemed to be this frantic rush to build and build and make all this infrastructure as rapidly as possible with no, you know, and, and all sorts of questions around the necessity of some of the projects, the really had they been thought through, the feasibility studies, all that. I, I had a sense a lot of that wasn't actually done. So, in fact, I would argue that, you know, a slowdown, if it comes as a result of this on some of these projects is probably not a bad thing. Um, and I think the time should be used wisely to make sure that, you know, the projects that are being implemented are really going to produce the benefit that everybody wants and that they're being done to the proper terms. So I would argue that, frankly, uh, the Pakistani government in particular 
um, should take advantage of this moment to, you know, really uh, renegotiate and really push and make sure these projects are going to get the outcomes that are really going to benefit uh, the people of Pakistan. So from my perspective, I don't actually think a slowdown is a bad thing on the CPEC perspective. I think at the end of the day, if the project makes sense, it's going to happen. Uh, if that happens tomorrow or if that happens in a couple of years, I don't necessarily, I mean, I realize there's a loss spent, there's a loss in terms of the benefits you can accrue, but actually getting the project right I think is more important than getting the project, you know, rushed done. So I actually think the patience is probably a good thing within that regard. In terms of the question around militancy, this kind of ties in, I would argue, to the question around divisions that we're seeing getting exacerbated. Um, that was raised in, in the previous answers. Uh, and I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Kush in particular mentioned to talk about this, uh, spoke about this quite, uh, quite wisely. I think that the divisions and inequalities that you're seeing getting exacerbated and highlighted by uh, COVID and which will get even worse, I suspect, as we see going forwards, are going to make uh, some of the issues, the kind of the ground uh, that gets laid as a result of these is the ground from which militancy can grow. And so I think we are going to see problems emerge from this going forwards. And I would argue you can actually see this already. And I think the interesting thing for me is that I think you'll see that emerging from, frankly, traditional places that we've always seen these problems. They will just be exacerbated and it will just sort of continue in that vein. But I would say look to other interesting new places where you actually might start to see it develop. I think the interesting question for me is how much this push online that you're seeing as a result of this sort of collective lock-in we're all having, how much will that actually get rid of jobs and how much will that change the working environment? And how much that might generate a whole reaction against technology and then anger against technology and what will that kind of mean what kind of potential militancy might that create the other one i think which is quite worrying which you're seeing in the united states in particular is this kind of uh, growth of kind of a sense of nativism and nationalism which is already there and it's already been a problem in the united states for some time it's going to get exacerbated you know what's the net result of a lot of what we're seeing happening um, in uh, in the western world in particular is government is coming in and putting huge amounts of money and really government, big government is becoming the big thing. And big government like that, you know, is both good and bad and can generate people who will say, oh, it's not doing enough. And it will generate people who are saying, oh, it's doing too much. It's intruding into my life. And that will generate a sort of counter reaction, which can express itself as militancy. So I think that's the kind of future militancy I think we can see potentially developing. The other final point I make on this very briefly is I think there is a real problem as well of existing problems not having gone away but uh, Western attention in particular in dealing with some of them is going away. So if we look at parts of Africa where we've had sort of various conflicts that have been going on for a long time, they're getting worse and they're getting worse at a moment where we can see everyone is pulling out from these places because they can't operate there because of the COVID crisis. So that is a negative thing, which is gonna mean that we're gonna see problems exa exacerbating um, and situations changing negatively on the ground, which will require intervention eventually, will require some sort of response eventually, but responding then to something which is worse than it is right now. I think Mali is the best example of this at the moment where we can see militants are starting to circle around the capital Bamako, um, you know, at a moment when frankly European forces are pulling out because of the COVID crisis. So, you know, I think that existing problems, again, we're seeing acceleration of existing issues going forwards. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Evan Saab, welcome back. Uh, we Thank recognize you. that you had some uh, technological glitch. I do have a question for you, so let me give this to you also. And if you'd like okay. to add to whatever um, uh, that, that you may want to. Uh, there's a question for you from Mariam Rashid, which says, uh, has Pakistan taken up a model to revamp its environmental commitments in a post-COVID era? If yes, is, which is the lead? Which countries can we take the lead from? Um, but uh, you know, feel free to make other comments if you like. Okay, I, I think uh, one or two points that I'd like to add, which probably will respond to a number of questions that have been raised during the discussion. I think you recall that Zarar Koro mentioned about the congestion in the cities. We also know that the COVID did attack where there's a vertical growth, which is in the urban areas. And if you look at it initially, it never was in the uh, rural areas. It is all the play of the urban centers and Europe also was the same. China cities were the same. So what I think one of the things that we can learn out of this is a very positive thing that we may like to do it and is the de-urbanization in the sense, not that you remove, or I would say stop the urbanization 
offer the rural development in the sense that if, let's say if I'm from the rural area and if there's a facility available, why would I leave and go to these cities? I think best is to respond not only to the COVID-19, but also the number of diseases that we have. And I think we are not even talking. And one of our scientists are talking is the dengue. Dengue people, a lot of people died and we are just waiting because the season has just arrived and we are focused on the other thing. And dengue has a different uh, altogether. It's a mosquito related. It's not, a, it's a known animal. So I would say, let's go with the urban, uh, more rural development where if the facilities are there, then there will be also, there'll be no congestion and so on and so forth. And this is something Mariam had mentioned. I think she talked about, and now Selma is also talking about the model that we need to follow. I think, frankly speaking, the best model is we ourselves should learn from our own data. Our scientists should sit together. And I personally think that in terms of the solution will always be developed in the, on the grounds here. So the, of course, there is a, one of the uh, thing is that bigger, bigger countries are, have their own problem funding and the politics. I think there's also, if I may mention, is there is a superpower game is going on, powerful game. So if something is happening in China, if you ever tell them that this is started from China, they said, no, it was not. But then the question is somewhere it did start. And uh, so I would not like to go into the power game of the region the power game of the uh, superpowers. But what I'll say, let's look at ourselves, look at inward looking, and we develop our own solutions. And this is the only way uh, that we can really have. And at the grassroots level, we go there, we communicate with them, and a rural is, to me, is, a, is heaven. You'd be surprised, some of the friends from uh, rural leaders are calling me, where are you? And I would say that I'm locked in into Islamabad. And they say, oh my God, if you were in Karachi, I would say, come, take a car and come inside. Now, uh, you see, they are uh, kind of saying that there is a solution uh, away from the vertical growth that we have. This is one. There's nothing else that I would like to add unless there's a question. Yeah, uh, yeah um, perhaps one more question, which has been kind of discussed earlier, but there's another um, the angle to um, the climate change issue and what kind yes. of steps would uh, the world, could the world take uh, for protection of the environment to keep safe from the climate change threat? Uh, this is from uh, Professor Ahmed Sayyid Menhas from uh, Karachi. I think as we know that we are the least contributor, but we are the sixth most affected country. And this is not produced by us. The climate change effects are from the Western world. Right now, my personal feeling is that this is not the time. They are not even attending to anything else other than this. But if we were to really talk about it, our voices should be increased. If a little Greta uh, could start the voice and blame the older generation in standing in the United Nations, then I think people from our country, they, must, they should prepare a voice and go to these forums and really talk about it that they need to uh, contribute to the fund. We are not getting the necessary fund because small funds are not going to help. One is that our own action that we do not go. For example, we have a hydro energy, we have a solar energy, and we have got a wind energy. Now this we can do ourselves. But then the other thing is that internationally, whatever the greenhouse emission is there, we really can't do it. It is at the level of uh, reach, uh, at the United Nations level. We must make a strong case. For example, just time the Prime Minister went there and made a very strong case, I would say. And similarly, the, our climate change minister is very professional. He's making the... But I think it must not be only them. It should be backed up by the people. And imagine the Greta, the little Greta Thunderbird, she, her voice was more, far more effective than even the Secretary General of the United Nations. So I would say, while we continue to work on all these funds that are internationally available, get our shares from the COP, the next COP 23, 24, but then prepare youth and women. I think uh, Farhana, Fardana Bari is there and she can tell us how to unite these and bring the, uh, the, this, the, the uh, segment which is most affected. But the women is most affected when by the way, when it happens in the glaciers melt in the Gilgit-Baltistan, 
and atabad lake is in front of us the example who was there it was the men was all working in uh, uh, down in the countries whether they were in pakistan in karachi or lahore or they were in dubai but the women they suffered so i think we need to strengthen and bring their voices and some of the organizations are doing it but at the local level or the domestic level i think internationally we must uh, government should sponsor those people voices and people like farzan abari and uh, koro they may join in to really take these voices to the international level raise the bar i would say raise the bar because if you don't speak nobody is going to speak for you because they have their own problems brilliant um uh, zarar can i turn to you now and uh, throw in a few questions and then we are coming to a close anyway um now this question is from hasham ahmed um whenever there is a vacuum someone will fit in and you said that yourself and uh, he also says that you alluded to the chinese stepping up their assistance and medical diplomacy and there are several references to medical diplomacy that were made um so um the eu failed as you said yourself uh, to act as a unitary force uh, uh, so everyone had to fend for themselves how will this affect the eu once this crisis is over do you see several european countries looking more towards china uh, or than the us on several occasions in the future after this is over so that's one question and the wheel also wants you to think of uh, saying something on how the weaponization of social media damage public trust on governance structures and one more uh, let me let me just finish this one too um uh, do you think that the world that has, which has already dominated dominantly controlled by classism sexism and racism would it change for the better uh, or would this nuisance will increase more how would this would it take it back to the rights movement kind of a situation you have the okay process. but ji um well um as far as the china question um i had a different perspective uh before this uh, webinar started and then after listening to mr rafaelo and i'd have to defer to him on this point you know since he is in fact european and his specialty of study is uh correct me if i'm wrong uh china related so i i would have to go with his view on it um so i think that that one has already been addressed i mean of course it's also a question of you know i mean uh, how the eu steps up now um and how china behaves in the future i mean things are fluid um as far as the weaponization of social media i'm not sure if i understand the question um weaponization by whom um and 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 to what end so um in the absence of like you know further clarity i mean as a general rule yes um i think that you know the weaponization of social media by various actors um is in some way aimed at you know uh, eroding trust in public institutions and governance structures i i don't see any reason for that to change in the near future um and as far as um miss rida anwar's question i think that that's been addressed pretty much um in in everything that i've ever talked about and i and i hate to you know be the prophet of doom and the raven of despair but i i see no silver lining um anywhere uh if i do see one i think it's because i'm trying so hard to see one um but but really realistically realistically again i see no conceivable projection in which any of this ends well for anyone yeah thank you um if there um, any of the participants have a kind of a one liner last point before i do my overall closing um you know please indicate that to me all right rafaelo you have yeah yeah okay um, uh, ma'am let 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 rafaelo speak and then you, you make your so I, i just wanted to very briefly uh add a comment about the eu because i think it's um it's it's it is true the eu had did not uh show up uh and play the role that i think everyone thought it would maybe in such a situation but and and you know i can understand uh the irritation and anger that there was and there still is but I think you know it's it's a bit difficult because the EU is ultimately only able to do what its member states will let it do. And I think the real problem is that ultimately all the member states don't agree because they're all facing it in different ways and they all have different opinions and different views on issues. Um and so I think a lot of the issues you see around the EU 
it gets it does get a sort of unfair kicking sometimes and i can understand why <laughs> but you know i think it is sometimes it's it's a real question of the member states within it won't let it do certain things so i think the eu responding in the first instance was really more a question of you know uh, it kind of goes back to the old problem that you have within the eu which is that you have some countries you know like italy which used to use uh, you know as a um, uh, you know, as a tool to sort of save its economy, devaluing its currency. You know, I remember when I used to go to Italy as a kid, you know, the lira was thousands of thousands per to the pound, right? Uh, nowadays, of course, they all have the euro and it's controlled by a central bank, which is more influenced heavily by Germany, who actually wants to keep the currency at a certain level. So, you know, the Italians would approach to deal with this problem with them to devalue their currency, to make everything more effective, and more fluid. They can't do that anymore because they don't control that because they've handed that over. So, and with it, so I think it's, there's a lot of dynamics within the EU the play in that direction. As we've seen going forward, the EU has gotten a bit better in terms of its response. So, you know, I, I just wanted to add sort of two fingers on that just to say, you know, the EU is somewhat hamstrung by the nature of the structure, which is that it can't tell member states to do stuff. Member states let it do, and they all have to collectively agree what they would like. And unfortunately, what we've seen in this situation is very much, I think, the sort of negative um, perspective, which is everyone has tried to look after themselves rather than focus on the collective benefit, which is what you would hope something like the EU would be able to do uh, more effectively. Thank you. Thanks. Susanna? I just want to say, like, um, you know, this pandemic does have also um, create some opportunities and there are some learnings, I mean, uh, provided if you're willing to learn. Uh, because first of all, like um, Nassar Memsab have mentioned, and there is so there is right now a reverse uh, migration from urban areas to rural areas, you know. So, um, and that has um, released immense pressure, you know, um, which already we had on our urban infrastructure because there are too many, there's a, there's a very, you know, uh, too many people, you know, there is a population pressure in the urban areas. So I think there is um, a ch there is an opportunity that how if we can retain these people in rural areas by then going into you know the rural development and in, you know having basically establishing agro agro based industry or you know try to generate um, uh, job uh, opportunities there so that we can retain people over there. And I think that can also take care of some of the problem that this that this is a very fast urbanization which is taking place in Pakistan. Similarly, I feel like, I, um, you know, what we have seen is the complete failure of the market forces and the private sector as far pub public health is concerned. So it's the state which is intervening. So it's very important for, um, for the state to uh, then think, you know, that how um, that the public health cannot be really um, devoid, you know, it's sort of being left to the, to the private sector and the market forces to take care of. So it's important for, um, you know, like not only that we have to um, uh, put more resources into health sector, but also the state has to take the funda fundamental responsibility for the public health. Um, and as for, I, I think the other issue, uh, another learning for us is in terms of food security. Uh, again, I think Pakistan probably doesn't have a, 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 a food reserves for more than few months. India had maybe for a year and a half, they're claiming that they have the food reserve for one and a half years, but Pakistan um, uh, doesn't have that. So I think we need to also see how this whole, um, you know, uh, procurement, because if we can't do the proper procurement because we do not have those kind of storage facilities, so and so forth. So I think there are quite a, a lot of learnings also uh, because of this uh, situation. And it, is, it has become so obvious Obvious. The solution actually has become so obvious. So one hopes that um, you know, uh, if the government wants, we are uh, somehow um, you know uh, out of this this uh, uh, pandemic. We will be able to uh, you know, in terms of governance, doing things not like the business as usual, but doing things you know, uh, learning from the experience here and doing things differently. It's one hope for you know for the best. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you need to bear with me for a couple of points. I, as, as we went along this very, very interesting discussion, I thought of some takeaways that one could, uh, one could uh, perhaps carry and think more about. Um, uh, and they can be at different levels. They can be at the individual level or the entity level or the home unit level or, at the, or the national level or at the, at the global level. So some of these thoughts, and, and I apologize for them being uh, in a random order. And I will, of course, use some of the ideas that have come from our uh, worthy panelists. Um, 
you know, the broader uh, issues that we need to uh, use. For example, the issue of data, that, that becomes more important when you go more on online and everything. So data needs need to be pointed out. Also, there's so much of information uh, overload. If we say this is the kind of data that we need, then perhaps it, it becomes useful. Simple activity like what do you do for a physical activity within the home? And then what do you do if you your home is just small one small room as there are says? Um, how do you do that? Food and water security at the at, at the unit level, but hygiene other than uh, just washing your hands. Uh, what do you do about that? Um, how do you um, go to the uh, the sense of um, gender participation and uh, in a broader understanding in socioeconomic fields? Uh, how do you use technology for the better? Now this was happening anyway, the artificial intelligence and so on and so forth. But uh, as rightly pointed out by our panel, uh, it, it is now further accelerating. And then we need to come up to that kind of level. Think of the uh, illiterate or the semi-literate uh, part of our society and how do they get to deal with the technology. Um, improvising to adjust with the health sensitivities uh, within the BRI2 or perhaps the uh, alternatives. Um, you know, one one uh, aspect that comes to mind today, you see we have so much of attention to the daily wages. Uh, we are sensitive to them. There are efforts that are being made by individuals, by entities, by the government. How do we make this kind of kindness that we have more sustainable? So there are several things one could say. And this issue of, and Maven Saab, thank you for bringing this particular point out, the issue of um, urbanization, which has been a significant problem, the de-urbanization, you could be in a, in a farm by yourself, um, have your own organic food, you, uh, grow it yourself and eat it yourself and so on and so forth, those, those kind of ideas. But in a broader, um, more global understanding, uh, the uh, medical diplomacy is perhaps the way to go. And several uh, times this came up about China. Uh, for the United States, the decision point to choose between how inclusive or exclusive does it want to be, how much of looking inward America first and those kind of ideas, how, how does that work? Um, and and let, me, let me borrow uh, the terminology that Zarayu made about how do we learn to do, deal with an increasingly insular world? Um, it's going to be a more of a do-it-yourself, the DIY kind of world. How do we deal with that? So uh, there's several thoughts. And, and um, ladies and gentlemen who are still listening in, um, I thank you for your participation. And, and I hope that wherever you are in your kitchens, in your lobbies, in your lounges, in your uh, home offices, uh, you can uh, do what the Italians do, uh, stand in the window and clap for this audience virtually so that um, the kind of issues they brought out on this table, we can actually think more about them. Uh, and thank you for uh, the institute that has taken the initi initiative. I hope you can generate some kind of these uh, main thoughts into some kind of a report which is usable from the policy perspective. Thank you very much, uh, panel. Um, you. Thank you very much, the audience. Thank you very much for the sponsors. Um, and until next time, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.